video will focus on prostitution in Victorian Los Angeles. During the Victorian era, sightseeing travelers riding through Los Angeles on the Southern Pacific Railroad would eagerly ask their porters to let them know when the train passed by an infamous stretch of Alameda Street, southeast of the old plaza. This portion of Alameda Street was part of the city's red light district which centered around an oiled down dirt road for more than 50 years. Called Hell's Half Acre, it was comprised of saloons, restaurants, and a row of low slung brick buildings with small pen-like rooms, not much wider than their front doors. They were known as cribs. In this photo, you can see the cribs as seen from the railroad tracks taken by photographer West and currently held by UCLA. Los Angeles in the Victorian era was booming. There were oil fields, there were ironworks, and the port of Los Angeles needed manpower and all kinds of resources to keep going. So this was a rapidly growing city even if you exclude Hollywood, which was also becoming a huge moneymaker for Americans at the time. Los Angeles was dependent on the men and women who were working really tough jobs. And in Victorian Los Angeles, we see prostitution as it was across the rest of the United States. For example, when we compare prostitution of the Western mining towns in Colorado, for example, to the prostitution of Los Angeles, we see a lot of similarities in how the women were treated and how they had very little rights and nobody really cared about them. You have to remember that this was America coming out of the Civil War and many families were completely ripped apart, many parents were dead, and there were abandoned children from coast to coast. Um, industries had been demolished due to the war, uh, you know, train lines had been blown up by the Union Army down south, and so when we look at these women in horrible positions in Los Angeles and elsewhere, we're seeing a group of people that didn't really have much, much else. They didn't really have many options. And so thankfully, um, there was the church in Los Angeles that was able to put an end to the cribs. But as you look at photos of these uh, American prostitutes, remember that they didn't have any privilege and they were expected to service up to 30 men a night in Los Angeles in the mining towns of Alaska, which is where these prostitutes are from. And, um, you know, in the mining towns of Colorado, they were expected to serve hundreds of men a night just because there weren't, there were so many more men than women uh, in those towns. So in Hell's Half Acre in Los Angeles, Outside the cribs, prostitutes stood on wooden platforms, displaying their charms to as great an expanse as the benign laws and humorously tolerant policemen of the day allowed. Inside the cribs, they serviced an estimated 13 to 30 men a night. These women lived at the constant mercy of John's pimps and landlords. One such landlord who I will discuss is Bartolo Ballerino. And Ballerino uh, was born around 1830 in Chile. People get it mixed up and say that he was born in Italy or Portugal, but I believe he was born in Chile. He was multilingual and migrated to California during the gold rush. After arriving in Southern California, he invested heavily in LA real estate, including the abandoned Alameda crib buildings. He bought up much of the land that comprised Hell's Half Acre, which had been the center of crime and violence in Los Angeles since the 1850s. Again, the decline of the nation during the Civil War caused crime spikes and unemployment in every American city. 
By the 1880s, Ballerino dominated the area and was known as the Crib King. Dozens of sex workers lived and worked at his, quote, international hotel. The hotel was described as shacks divided into small compartments called cribs, which are rented to fallen women of all nationalities. The wily Ballerino also controlled a saloon and restaurant that catered to pimps, johns, and prostitutes. The girls were doing no harm, Ballerino said years later. They were minding their own business and paying their debts. He claimed to take care of the women who lived in his pens. I even built the girls a park. I planted flowers and helped to make them feel comfortable. But life in the cribs was anything but comfortable. Sex workers were forced by Ballerino to patronize their saloons and they were constantly nickel and dimed for improvements. They were also not allowed to live full time in the cribs. They were expected to find their own lodgings. Women from all over the world worked for the cribs. There was a row of Japanese cribs, a French area called Little Perry, and crib rows worked by Chinese, Black, Belgian, Hispanic, Mexican, Native American, and white women. Each had their set of pimps. Pimp violence against sex against prostitutes was frequent. And there was a woman, Ella Powers, who wanted to leave the business. When she told Michael Walsh, her pimp, he shot her. Walsh was living off of her earnings and saw his livelihood threatened, and he had previously cut her with a knife. Suicide was rampant, with reports of women taking overdoses of opium and other drugs. There were also a lot of STDs. Uh, syphilis at the time was a huge problem. Around 10% of the entire nation had syphilis and other communicable diseases ravaged the crib district. There was always violence. One reporter told the story of a prostitute named Adele who worked in the crib owned by Ballerino. After being severely beaten by a John, she was bedridden for 15 days. During this time, she did not occupy her crib and likely occupied a boarding house. And when Ballerino demanded the full month's rent, the woman refused. She finally compromised on $25, deducting $5 for the time she did not occupy the cribs. When he found that the money was not forthcoming, he got his son Dick and another man to dig a hole in the sidewalk in front of her door. The slabs of paving stone were set up against the woman's door, blocking ingress, and when she protested, she was assaulted. Ballerino and other red light landlords were able to operate in the open for many years, with the law largely on their side. Like in Mexico, prostitution in Los Angeles was not illegal, but there was a state law that prohibited renting out rooms intended for immoral purposes. This law was rarely enforced, and so the crib system thrived. Again, we're only as strong as the enforcement behind the laws. There can be a million laws, but if nobody enforces them, then they might as well mean nothing. In 1897, the crib district even received the dubious honor of being mentioned in a souvenir sporting guide published that year for frisky gentlemen. While women's aids groups and religious leaders had been attempting to close the cribs since their inception, the true beginning of their demise was caused by party politics. In 1902, the Republican Los Angeles Times threw its support behind P.W. Powers, the party's mayoral candidate. In an attempt to tie the Democratic candidate, Meredith Snyder, to vice, the Times waged a campaign against Chris Buckley, a Democratic booster known as the Blind White Devil. The women of Hell's Half Acre paid exorbitant rent for their squalid cribs, which often consisted of nothing more than a makeshift bed and a wash basin. Buckley had recently gained control of this series of cribs owned by the late T. Bauer, and the Times claimed that he and Ballerino were attempting to create a super district of prostitution and gambling in Hell's Half Acre. Between them, they controlled property that is said to produce an income of nearly $100,000 a year, which was millions of dollars back then, an income that is a direct rake-off from the wages of sin. The Times began to advocate for the abolishment of the red light district. 
where their coverage of the of Ballerino and the red light district had once been neutral and lighthearted, covering his estrangement from his wife, for example, it was now accusatory and inflammatory, even after Snyder was elected mayor. Social justice and church groups began to take up the cause in earnest. More so church groups, I don't, there weren't that many social justice groups back then. In 1903, Mrs. Charlton at home stood on the floor of East Los Angeles Christian Church and read to the audience from a clipping taken from the Times. Buckley and Ballerino are renting those cribs every night near the heart of this city in direct violation of the laws of the state of California, she said. When Mayor Snyder and Chief of Police Elton took office, they swore to uphold without favor the laws of the Commonwealth which they know do not countenance the existence of houses of prostitution, uh, different from street walking, uh, which was a, a difference in the California law. You could not have houses of prostitution. With the Herald and other morning papers joining the Times' new pet crusade, citizen reformers in the church began to take action. Church groups blockaded the crib district and attempted to drive away Johns, Johns who chose to patronize the cribs anyway were warned that their reputation was in grave danger, and this was partly due to the church's new interest in the press. Um, when boys were flush with recent payrolls or winning streaks at poker, they sought the sumptuous parlor houses of commercial New High or Marcia Saul streets in Los Angeles. But when their pockets were light, they had to be content with such feminine society as might be encountered in the cribs. Even though they made much less money than the sex workers in the more high-toned brothels, the women of Hell's Half Acre had to pay exorbitant rent, and they had to pay $18 a week or about $70 a month to be in the cribs servicing men. Um, so this is something that the church ladies were going to and getting themselves involved with. Having the church involved in um, patrolling and fighting against prostitution is nothing new. There are various orders of nuns in the United States and in England who would make it their life's work to try to um, save these women and also deliver their babies. We have already made it impossible for any man who has a reputation to lose to patronize the cribs, one minister warned. If reasoning will not suffice for the men we find down in that degraded district, we shall photograph them with flashlights and put their pictures in the papers. Women began visiting the Tenderloin district in earnest, attempting to help other women who wanted to leave. The women workers have gone to this district with a closed carriage, one report stated, so that any girl with a mind to give up the evil life might at once be accompanied to the carriage and taken to one of the rescue homes until further provision could be made for her. They also left cards with the names of rescue homes set up by private citizens, including a woman known as Mrs. Watson, who had operated a home known as Door of Hope since the 1880s. Mayor Snyder realized that something had to be done in light of all of this religious agitation, or he and the Democrats would continue to be crucified in the media. On September 12th, Ballerino was arrested on Los Angeles Street for renting a crib for the purpose of prostitution. Ballerino fought these charges doggedly. Charges were brought repeatedly as the fearful prostitutes and complaints did not show for trial or forgot who Ballerino was if they did testify. One of the newspapers goes into detail about Ruby Miller, who was one of Ballerino's um, tenants, and they also describe a woman who was found back in the cribs after agreeing to testify against Ballerino. Ballerino attempted to bribe a city clerk, and the cribs were fenced in to keep out the pesky Salvation Army. In December 1903, the police finally took a stand and raided the entire district, chasing away the hundreds who lived and worked there. Um, instead of the myriad of twinkling red lights and the glow of incandescent bulb bulbs from the cribs that were always a striking feature of these houses of the Scarlet Women, last night the American section was in complete darkness. 
Last night, the atmosphere was as peaceful after the raid and as serene as that which surrounds the cross-surmounted old adobe pile just over the other side of the plaza, where the Church of Our Lady of Angels stands in its solitude. Ballerino was furious. He cursed the damned old priests and preachers, the newspapers, and the troublemaking women of the Temperance's Union who he blamed for his troubles. The Temperance's Union would inspire such figures as Mother Jones, um, who saw the ravages of alcohol on American families and fought back. The crib district was not down for long. In an attempt to get the government off his back, he built a series of cribs on the second floor of the International Hotel. When asked who he would rent them to, he replied, anybody. Rent room to you, rent room to him, rent to man, woman, boy, you have money, you rent room. Soon, prostitutes came back into the district. At the International Hotel, it was reported that the new elevated location is brilliantly lit up, and as these women flout themselves in and out of doors or pose at the windows, they are really more conspicuous than when they were located on the ground. Ballerino made sure for the Alameda Cribs that he had incredibly large window shutters so women could pose in the windows and uh, come in and out of the cribs. Um, workmen were hired to quickly change the cribs so they appeared to be legitimate businesses. I don't think they fooled anybody. Crowds of men and boys with a number of the fallen women intermingled among this work and watched the transformation interestedly. In each of the cribs, there was placed a small counter and a tier of shelves. Uh, partitions were also erected, making two small rooms out of one. The counters and shelves were used for the sale of cigars, tobacco, and every crib woman was somehow expected to go into the cigar business. Anticipating more foot traffic, many of the women on the second floor of Ballerino's International Hotel told the Times they planned to move to the first floor and go into the, quote, cigar business. However, the city did not let up and continued to arrest and prosecute Ballerino and other crib owners for renting to prostitutes. He was eventually convicted in February of 1904 and sentenced to 30 days and fined $500. The reign of the crib king was over. After his release, Ballerino's crib business was decimated. He retreated to the International Hotel where he lived in a dingy room, much like the ones he had rented out to hundreds of desperate women. In one of his last interviews before he died, the old crib king told a reporter, this town is going to the dogs, it's getting too darned good. By the end of the decade, the cribs and saloons of Hell's Half Acre had been cleared out. The prostitutes who had inhabited the cribs didn't disappear. They moved on to working in apartment houses, bordellos nestled in the hills and the streets. For decades, it seemed all traces of Hell's Half Acre had vanished, replaced by the 101 freeway and a Union Station garage. But in the mid-1990s, an archaeologist dug through the old crib district latrines. The digs revealed a bottle for a tonic of opium and brandy, face creams, bottles of champagne, breast pumps indicating children had been born there and lived there, a valuable porcelain doll's head, and one bottle of Darby's prophylactic fluid. What is Darby's prophylactic fluid? These aquamarine bottles can be still found today if you dig or beachcomb or uh, go mudlarking. Darby's prophylactic fluid came to uh, popularity really in the 1880s where we start seeing newspaper advertisements for it. And what it was, was a bottle to be used in any sick room for uh, cleaning and sanitizing. And I have read reports that it was used in the Civil War for sanitizing wounds um, but what I could really read about it was it was a common household liquid and Darby's prophylactic fluid I believe was just splashed on the area to be um, disinfected and so I think these prostitutes would splash it on themselves or maybe the Johns would splash it on themselves or the men would splash it on themselves and then 
you know, do the deed. So I believe that's how it was used. It was, it was sort of difficult to determine, but that's the case. One has to remember that the fear of STDs was very real in the 1890s and 1910s, and there were many scientists working on cures. One of the cures that was created in 1907 was arsephanine, also known as salvrasan or compound 606. The portrait artist Renoir actually talked about how great it was and how he hoped that it would introduce this new era of freedom because syphilis had ravaged America and Europe for so long. It was released in the 1910s as the first effective treatment for syphilis and relapsing fever. It was also the first modern antimicrobial agent. It was synthesized in Paul Ehrlich's lab. Ehrlich was a German scientist and the anti-syphilitic activity of the compound was discovered by one of his Japanese colleagues, Sahihiro Hata, in 1909. He theorized that by screening many compounds, a drug could be discovered that would have antimicrobial activity but would not kill the patient. And so this um, drug was considered a silver bullet. It was initially called 606 because it was the sixth in the sixth group of compounds synthesized for testing that ended up being successful and it was marketed by Hoax AG under the trade name Salversan in 1910. We can see kits of it going into the 1930s. What patients were expected to do was inject themselves with the um, material using a hand-pumped syringe some of the side effects attributed to it included rashes, liver damage, and risks of life and limb due to improper handling and administration. Eventually, they found a soluble arsenical compound, which was easier to prepare, and it became available in 1912. Less severe side effects, such as nausea and vomiting, were still common and eventually all of these treatments were replaced by penicillin in the 1940s. But this material shows how dangerous going to brothels such as those on Alameda Street were. So what happened to the Ballerino family? Well, Ballerino did not live long after his 1905 arrest and imprisonment. He died in 1909 and quickly his estate, his very valuable estate, was the subject of contests. Uh, real estate men sued the Ballerino family um, for 10,000 services, for services and restoring harmony to the family circle because Ballerino and his wife were living apart uh, when he died and I believe had divorced. Um, Ballerino left only five dollars to his widow and children and then they contested this and then received two-thirds of the estate which was valued in the in the millions of dollars today um, at 350 grand. There were ten sons and daughters but there was also a nurse Mrs. Della Garrison Queen um, whom he had willed everything upon his death and so she did not receive as much as she would have due to the claims of the widow and children. Um, the widow died the same year as Ballerino so I'm, I'm not sure if she brought the case herself or if it was somebody else. Uh, another th weird thing was Ballerino was rumored to have buried his entire treasure and he was rumored to have buried his money in the crypt district. And so there were all these men digging for it, but eventually it was revealed that there was just no evidence of buried treasure after they were digging uh, holes and tunnels and all that kind of thing. So it is pretty remarkable that archaeologists were able to discover um, old bottles and stuff like that even today due to all of the digging around the cribs. Turning to Ballerino's family, he had a very large family and we can see photos 
of many of his children and grandchildren on the internet. Um, there was mention of one of his sons helping him out with the family business, and I believe it's that son that I can't find photos of. I can find photos of many of his other children, but not that one. Some of the children seem to have died in infancy, otherwise we just don't know their death date. But Ballerino's wife was uh, born in Mexico, Maria Amparo Salidio Ballerino, and they were married in 1856. She was around the same age as Ballerino. There wasn't a huge age gap. Uh, they were still married when Ballerino was making his fortune by pimping out women. Um, uh, prostitution was legal in Mexico at the time and still is legal so that might be why his wife didn't have a huge issue with the way he was earning his money maybe she thought it was just you know okay um, eventually she did divorce him citing that he hadn't been acting like a husband so I, I'm not sure you know what that behavior was but one of the sons was Austin Ballerino, and he went on to have multiple children. He worked a very respectable job as a carriage streetcar painter and then a road painter. Interestingly, one of his sons, Monroe, who was the brother of this woman, um, died young, and he was a sort of piano prodigy, incredibly good at playing the piano, very smart. Um, but he couldn't he couldn't sleep inside so he was sleeping outside and he eventually got very sick and then was placed in the care of someone who was Catholic he then wanted to convert to Catholicism and it seems that the other members of the family were not Catholic so this caused quite a stir within the ballerino family when it came time for Monroe ballerino to be buried the catholic church refused to bury him in the catholic cemetery citing that they didn't have any evidence of his conversion and this hurt the ballerino family um quite a lot i think this is an interesting piece of history because it might not have been something that the ballerinos um, maybe they didn't realize that the church had fought their father so hard and had really stood against the um, immorality of their father. So the intersection of the Ballerino family and the Catholic Church is a very interesting one. There were many, many children and um, at least 10 and great-grandchildren as well as grandchildren we know that one of his sons, Alfredo Ballerino, or Fred Ballerino, um, I believe, died in World War I. So there was incredible death in that war from on the American side. The rest of the family, I can't find anything to indicate they expressed sorrow or disappointment as to how their father treated these women. Um, when he would collect rent, he had a whip with him, and so he would um, just, you know, use that to intimidate his tenants. He was not a good man. He was a very slick, immoral man, and it's very interesting that we can see in all of these sort of early historic photos, the impact Alameda Street had on Victorian Los Angeles.